Well, Dustin, it's a pleasure to have you here in in all your spare time. Thank you for coming I, I, on. I'm often told that. <laughs> um, we sat together, oh, I don't know, a uh, couple of years ago now in Kingston. And, and I think I was just getting to know you. And you, first of all, let me know that you uh, were a scholar of, of Martin Buber's work. And then you, you added that it wasn't even so much the conventional notion that a lot of us think of when it comes to to Buber and his his um uh, his his focus on uh, on relationship and really that delineation of of relationship but you brought up uh the fact that you were even more interested with his work on relationship I think with animals and even with with things with with uh, objects and so mm-hmm. um I wanted to bring you on to the podcast in part, and I was thinking about it kind of all day today in my office, uh, anticipating our our uh, conversation. You know, because it it's just an interesting uh, area of thought to consider how two people uh, connect. And uh, and as a therapist, I'm I'm constantly uh, I'm constantly oscillating between the fact that I think I'm just making everything up and, and maybe occasionally I actually uh, connect with somebody. So yes. thank you for coming on. And, uh, uh, and I, I'd love to start with how you, uh, initially became interested in, in Buber's work or why you chose to, to investigate that so deeply. Uh, I, I'd, I'd be wary of saying I do anything deeply, but um, <laughs> why did I get in this? Because I think Buber adds a kind of new category to the way we think about knowledge and dialogue. Um, so if you think, I mean, the term dialogue has become, I would say, sort of cheap, right? I mean, it, it doesn't mean much. It's used by human resource departments as well as anyone else. But his notion of dialogue like I, part of the reason the term dialogue has become so cheap is because we know there's something there, like there's something to the kind of concept. And so you throw it around and it sort of points at this, but it's it's easily co-opted. But I think he sort of saves the concept from this kind of cheap co-option. Um, and what he says is, I mean, if, if you want me to just sort of express in sort of um, boober for dummies kind of terms, something like this if i say i know like every single thing about you right like every single thing like the past present future your genome whatever your history um and i know everything about you if i was to then meet you what would change right um is there something extra that happens when i meet you that is not about you right and so like an easy way of thinking about this is talking to versus talking about so i can talk about you and know everything about you from talking about you but i don't know you right until i've talked to you we want to that's an intuition at least that most of us want to hold to that talking to gives you something that talking about someone doesn't doesn't give you and the question is is like what is that and in a weird way this thing that i can only get in dialogue with you and in a weird way, it's nothing, because if it was something, I could talk about it. So there's this weird non, no thing, nothingness that comes, or like just non-thingness that comes with when I talk to you or when I dialogue with my cat um, or a tree or, or anything, like a kind of relational type of knowledge that can't be captured any other way than, than, than interacting with someone. Um, and so when I, when my first year university, when this sort of lit up in my head, um, I realized that it was something that I wasn't learning anywhere else, um, either in my philosophy courses or my humanities courses. And so that sort of brought me into working with him. Did, did, did Buber think that this was, that this happens innately or automatically between two people, or is this, this is something that one has to intentionally evoke in a relationship? Uh, neither, because he's annoying like that. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, um, he says it has to be a combination of will and grace, um, like the television show, uh, or the Christian theological concept. So like, you have to be open to it but it won't always happen. In fact, if there was a mechanism for making it happen consistently, sure. it wouldn't be real, right? Because it would then be a something that could be captured. So it's a kind of trained spontaneity, which he thinks can happen in some therapeutic situations, some friend situations, some situations, again, going for a walk. 
The only exception for him, because he's a religious thinker much more than I am, is that he thinks God is the thing that you can always talk to, but not necessarily talk about. Um, it's, I've, I've oversimplified his position there, but basically that's the main thing with, with like, there's a certain way that the holy is always accessible to you. Um, but you have to be open to it properly. And it changes for him depending on time and place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, uh, no. So the short answer is no, there's no way of, of, pro of making sure it always happens, but neither is it totally random. Um, so, I mean, and this is a sort of earlier 20th century, like cliche Heidegger is something similar. You have to be, a, it's a kind of openness to things, a sort of clearing yourself or waiting um, and then seeing what happens um, and to, but, but again, yeah, like, especially with two people, I can't make you like, sure. dialogue with me, um, <laughs> right? I in, can just um, make you dialogue with me. That, that. I mean, you can make us talk, but uh, <laughs> so like, yeah, so when I say talking to and talking about, there's, sure. that's a cheap version of what he's getting at. For well, this sure, reason, right. right. That's, like, what's, yeah. that's what's trickled down to sort of popular, yeah. you know, that's his, yeah. that's where his that's, bread and butter. Yeah, but I mean, really, it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit. I mean, the problem with talking as a, as a sort of metaphor for what he's talking about is that um, you can, uh, for him, have a relationship with, say, a pond, and obviously the pond doesn't talk. So the weird thing with him is this question, why does he use the word dialogue when a lot of the things he's talking about are, are non-speaking relationships? And, and if anything for him, speaking the way we are now can actually hide or make relationships harder because uh, the speaking, if, and, and stop me if I go too far with this, but so speaking is a weird thing because I can like write down our words and sort of have them as, a, as an object. And so it seems very permanent talk, even though it's ephemeral, like as I talk, my words disappear. This is being recorded. So, you know, we can go back to this and listen to it again. So in a weird way, this conversation lives on independently of us or independently of whatever relation we have right now. So it makes this relationship seem more solid than it is. So it hides it in a sense. Um, so Buber is very clear that in a way, the sort of tenuousness of all dialogue, you won't discover with human beings. You're more likely to discover it with a cat because mm -hmm. when you're talking to a cat, the cat is very aware. I mean, I don't know if you're a cat person, but a lot yep. of cats are very aware when you're talking to them that like, they're like, is, do you mean, he says like, do you mean me? Are you talking to me? Is this serious? Is this happening? And then it disappears. And so the cats teach you a type of anxiety about um, how dialogue is very ephemeral. Um, and this also, well, Babe Hoover has been used by the business world and the therapeutic world and the sociological world extensively. I don't know that any of them have really come to terms with this sort of fragility because everyone wants to use it, right? They want to use dialogue. Sure, and sure. the problem is, is in a weird way, you can't. Um, sure, sure. You can That's use like the when word I, When I get hired... Or companies try to hire me to to uh, uh, help help their workforce sort of become a bit more embodied and vulnerable, yeah. so they can become more productive. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, but it is. Well, I don't know if you want your workplace to be vulnerable. Uh, the, the the sort of Marxist to me kind of bridles at that. But um, right. right. But uh, yeah. But I mean, a lot of the sort of trickle trickle down isn't bad. I mean, it's just that it misses something that you can get from like. A sort of deeper dive into the text but um there's nothing wrong with the sort of forms but boober and also i'm not sure boober's notion of therapy would have been that great in practice i mean um and i just don't know i know like for him the therapeutic situation he thinks a lot of people's problems that they, they've lost the ability to relate to things properly and so the therapeutic situation is like a like a separated off bubble for dialogue so you can sort of help train someone to re-engage in relationships um but this of course is all very limited um very limited um of applicability i'm sure i mean uh but uh, i mean he was very very hostile to young and i think was engaged in a weird competition with freud as almost every other austrian jewish intellectual was i mean there was a way that freud was like the big the Leviathan. Um, I want to come back to that in a sec. I just wanted to uh, uh, relay that what you said about the uh, that that animals in some ways are, are more conducive to to an extent because we hide perhaps behind behind language. That often in my practice, 
um, whether it's in couples or, or individuals, especially those that are remarkably shut down, it's their animals actually that'll be the one the one place in their whole life that they feel like they you know a, a spouse will come in and say he doesn't or she doesn't talk to anybody else except yeah in some way and then that'll be actually the straw that breaks the camel back which you know i guess goes to freud and the lost object but like if they lose the cat or the dog that's like oh, i see you know, yeah, then, yeah. then 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 you know there's cracks in the armor and uh um yeah that makes sense i mean i uh yeah, again, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of stuck in this very limited world, so I don't actually deal with real people if I can help it. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> yes, um, that's my job to come in and, and uh, you know, at least connect the dots to an extent to clinical work. Yeah. Uh, um, what, what was his hostility to Jung? Do you, do you remember? Um, he thinks that Jung internalizes things that are found actually only in the world. Um, he also thought that Jung was proto-fascist, which, you know, fair enough. And also, um, but for him, he thinks Jung would be even better off if he just sort of dropped religion rather than try to make it like an internal need of human beings, because it gets rid of the relational element. So if you say that God is found within or the need for God is kind of like innate, then you sort of kill the relationality. Um, and uh, I mean, you see this with students all the time. They come in, religious students come in, they think they love Jung because they think that he gives them religion back. And then they realize that like he doesn't. Um, I'm not as hostile as um, Buber is with Buber for this reason. And also they also just wrote at each other. Like they just had several public attacks on each other. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the whole Eranos thing for Buber was basically an attempt on the part of like for for liberal technocratic society to like have its cake and eat it afterwards so to have you know a, a kind of fully mechanistic world but like spirituality is something you could do on at home and on the weekend or whatever and for boober religion is either all the time or it's not at all right? uh -huh. well in and that like, light then was he prescriptive uh I know earlier this wasn't, you know, this isn't something, and, and this touches on a lot of psychoanalytic theory, but but this isn't something that you can somehow just willingly manifest. Uh, but was he prescriptive vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, uh, you know, a kind of attention throughout one's life or training or... or, or uh... So in, intention and attention, I mean, I think two things that haven't been really studied enough period is, is is very very important for boober and action um him like a lot of people i like like even like purse and other people for them like paying attention is is the beginning of anything like ethics or religion like until you can pay attention uh you've just got kind of glimmerings or a, a ecstasy or these sorts of momentary things and until like his attention is in a sense the beginning of a kind of um commitment to a relationship um and and with relationships because he thinks they're ephemeral it's a weird thing because you're committed to something that's that's going to disappear it has to um, sure sure so for him relationships like the moment of a relation cannot last forever it's impossible um not because of practical reasons but because if you were to make it last forever you would just sort of become disconnected from the rest of the world and that would make it no longer a relationship sure was that a kind of uh, necessary suffering for him to? He to called have it to... melancholy. Uh -huh. Like he, he called it like, um, but the the melancholy of like the human position for him is that relations all end, um, and uh, and I mean in this respect he's like Freud, like who just who you know is very clear that there is no way out, um, that uh, you know everything you love will die, and you have to like deal with that. Um, Buber's problem there is he just, again, he thinks that Freud makes a lot of things internal. So, you know, Freud talks a lot about guilt, and I'm sure you deal with this all the time, and guilt feelings. And, you know, Buber says, no, no, guilt is real. Like, it's a real thing. You can be guilty or not guilty. It's not a feeling. Um, there's a feeling you have when you're guilty. <laughs> and sometimes you can have that feeling when you're not guilty. But guilt is real, and you, you, you probably, like, are guilty, if, according to Buber. So for some stuff. Uh, he wasn't like a doom and gloom religious thinker at all. In fact, he's less doom and gloom than Freud, but he, for him, this sort of move on the part of a lot of, because the therapeutic situation 
is a weird blend of, as you know, of, 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 of I shouldn't be telling you what the therapeutic situation is. For, for Buber, what the therapeutic situation is, is a weird blend of like theory and, and practice. And so the type of theory changes, right? And this is, I guess, Freud's like innovation. Um, but I'm losing my thread. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> isn't that isn't that apropos of our conversation? <laughs> maybe I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just tired. Um, but uh, but yeah. The, the, the... Well, so, I mean, yeah. I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but but yeah. I I I I think that that is probably the single hardest thing for me as a you know someone who sits with people all day long is is confronting the hunger uh, and the anxiety of. Uh, you know, noticing within myself the desire to cover the hunger over with my own words, theories, mastery well, so of my I mean, profession. And I mean, I mean, I think for Buber, part of the problem in the therapeutic situation too is is like it requires a lot of like patience, right? Because it may not work every session, and then this becomes much more complicated because you know, therapy is expensive. So, um, if you're shelling out, you know, 150 bucks an hour, you kind of want you want your relationality. So there's a temptation, I'm assuming, to sort of sure offer that in some sort of ersatz form um and sure. this and so this avoiding that um is, is for buber is, is is important and he doesn't think that most people are able to do it he also thinks in a way it's it's a bit of a it can't be fully um systematized that not everyone can be a therapist that there, there has to be a kind of some people can heal and some people can't um and you can and some people can only heal some types of people etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, he, he specifically referenced this he wrote this um is... i that's the first part definitely in the second part uh i'm not sure if that's my interpolation it wasn't that. yeah i'm just I'm but no, no, the first part, he yeah, was so specific absolutely. about hmm. oh yeah 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 no so he's he's um yeah no so he's very clear about the, the first point and i think the second point is part of that discussion that like um, the problem with psychoanalysis is the belief that you can actually have a theory in a standalone sense of the therapeutic because of what we said before that it's it's like a will and grace combo so there has to be a spontaneous element now this is all very romantic i mean of course in in reality i don't know that this actually pans out at all i have no idea i mean again i don't deal with human beings um but like uh well i think i mean I was um, reflecting on this actually in the last session of my day today before we met, uh, and it was the first time I was meeting somebody, and I was simultaneously aware that there was something, you know, um, that there was a kind of hunger and pressure in the moment, but I was aware that this, for this to in any way, shape, or form be, I don't know, uh, thought or or come into relationship will take a long time <laughs> and and i i made the remark actually that that these types of sort of relational uh disturbances that cause the human being to you know remain in a perpetual state of either anxiety or shutdown uh in those in those courses of treatment that i have done it number one it's years and number two when i look back i realize that 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 I didn't often know what I was doing except holding a kind of space and and uh and that and that you know you we you mentioned Roger before before we got on together but but that that was something that he often I keep in the back of my mind that they will make use of you in in whatever way they need you in that moment. yeah <laughs> and, and uh yeah you know that makes sense I know Carl Rogers is is the person who felt most able to talk to about these sorts of issues, um, the one he felt le the least sort of separated from. Uh, not that they agreed on everything, but uh, but the Carl Rogers Buber dialogue is called a dialogue and not a conflict for a reason. <laughs> Whereas a lot of his discussions with other people, like, like Carl Jung, it was just hostility. They just clearly despised each other and were not shy about putting that in print. Mm -hmm. um, and then Freud, uh, it's trickier, but he did publish a book called Moses within a year of Freud of publishing a book called Moses and didn't reference him once. So, uh, <laughs> um, so that was that was a move. Um, and when it comes to inanimate objects, mm -hmm. do you mind saying a bit more about what what Buber was fascinated in that regard? Or, I mean, so for him, inanimate objects. I mean. 
you have to be very careful about so the weird thing with dialogue because it's it's spontaneous and because it's somewhat singular um there's you have to be very careful with talking about types because um i mean you have to to carve up the world but in a way of course in one sense you're going to relate to every object differently but also different types of objects are related to differently so for instance if you're working with a machine that's probably different than looking at a television and that's probably different than carving a, a, a figure on a, a piece of bone or whatever um to use one of the the types he uses or, or a cave wall um and like a and also for him the, the very first have to like distinguish between a kind of appreciative relationship and a kind of creative relationship um not that there's not something creative but in, in even in like an appreciative relationship i'm lying under a tree and i and i suddenly have this kind of connection with it there's something creative there but not as much as someone who's painting the tree right who who sort of takes the form of the relationship and and, and kind of permanently um and closes it and the, and the artistic relationship is is one which is is nice for illustrating the kind of way that the relationship falls back into the mundane because you know maybe while you're painting it you have this kind of relation but then it's just a, it's a painting right yes and then the painting might reawaken relations in the future but it might not right um yes yes so it's it's the kind of concrete thing left over like the way the recording of these words will be left over when we're done um <laughs> Which is where uh, I can see his his uh, you know Jung perhaps co-opting the religious experience for these kinds of activities. Uh, I could imagine, as you're saying, Buber uh, insisting on a kind of separation that this sometimes yeah. it's just you're just painting. This is oh, and and more extreme. He would actually say that experiences just aren't important. That experiences are a weird way of trying, like turning religion into an experience is like turning guilt into a feeling. It's 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 trying to take something real and relational and and capture it like experience is something you have on vacation to a certain extent and i mean every time i've done something major in my life someone has someone who i've, I've always usually disliked them has said something like well they will create great experiences or or they can't take your experiences from you and this is just another mode of accumulating things right it, this it would be seems, the, this would be what they say to you is that yeah, right Yeah, like you'll have a great experience uh, if you're doing you're doing this crazy. and i mean i've always bridled at that because i've never really wanted well, not never, but it's been a long time since I've wanted experiences and that sort of sense of something you you just collect in your head. Um, you know, the way, but, um, and again, I lost the train of thought. So yes, yeah, so has... the problem with Jung is that Jung has turned religion into an experience. So that's already the problem. It's not that he uses religious experiences incorrectly. It's that he thinks of religion as experiential. That's the problem. Um, whatever you do with them at that point for him is bad. Therapy, scrapbooking um going to church on the weekends and being an atheist the other five days or six days or however many days are in a week that sort of stuff that's his issue right is that you've turned it into something that can be turned on and off um and well relations are turn themselves on and off you don't get to have that you don't get to control the switch um it, for the exact reason they said before you cannot make your partner dialogue with you that's a kind of torture like talk tell us where the the bomb is is not that well it's a kind from... of torture but it's a kind of futile i mean eventually you're going to reach the the melancholy that he <laughs> oh you'll reach it but you may get something out of it first right i mean we all know there's value in a kind of crude sense in forcing someone to engage in dialogue with you in the right context you can get something out of it um i mean again hr departments love this stuff for a reason uh but you know so that, that would be his issue, I think. Um, and that's what he's afraid of in the therapeutic situation. But it's also what he thinks is its potential is, is precisely that it's sort of in a way fake, but in a good way or a virtual, if you prefer, or enclosed in a bubble. But there's a, sure. there's a that it provides a space to like um, exercise your ability to relate. Right. Um, inanimate <laughs> objects, sorry. Well, and, th and that's where him and Jung, I guess, would align because they both, from what, uh... I'm hearing you describe there was an emphasis on holding this kind of tension that that it's the entry problem right it's yeah. it's you know you have to somehow submit to it <laughs> yeah and uh yeah yeah and for him he holds that children are sort of able so children aren't pan theistic or uh pan psychic they're pan relational and i mean in my experience with kids this is true they like yell at things and they bump into them and they will talk to things and they 
mimic sounds of animals and so on and so forth. And uh, the object relation, I mean, you see it with children, they have a much easier time relating to objects than we do. Um, not all children, but most children. Did, did and, he articulate what he thinks um, happens, what, what changes or what, what is lost? Uh... Um, he thinks that basically the, 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 the let's see, we keep going back to the same thing, but the, the, the fact that the relational world is, is transitory means it's not stable. You can't build anything on it. It's insecure um, necessarily. So your need for security, uh, which is a real need, he, he doesn't dismiss it, uh, requires that you also have a world that stands in space and time like a solid thing you, you can live in. And, um, and so the question for him is, does this world block relations or does it not? And he would say, and I think he's right about this, that um, the current way that we build that kind of stable world in space and time, the dependable world of work and, you know, socializing and vacationing and whatever is, 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 is very bad for allowing for the sort of spontaneity um, that relation requires. So he says that basically the older, the, the kid doesn't have to live in that world because the kid has that world looked after for them. Right, right. And so right. adulthood is, is difficult in that you have to simultaneously build a home and things that aren't constantly chaos. I mean, it's terrible for children to grow up in, in a chaotic environment like that. But on the, so, um, but on the other hand, allow for spontaneity nonetheless. This is something I'm, I'm terrible at. And I think a lot of the time you asked why I was drawn to Boober at the beginning, you're also often drawn to people who like deal with things that you're, you're bad yeah, at. Research is me search, right? Yeah, yeah. So like <laughs> you find one of your flaws and you sort of um, think that Just studying it enough will fix life. <laughs> it. it. It won't fix it. It will do nothing. The thesis cures is bullshit, but, um, but uh, whatever. I mean, you know, now I'm, I'm in too deep to change gears now. Um, <laughs> On that note, did he did he was he self reflective in his own life about? Uh, he was self reflective, but I mean, he you know, for a guy who write a book called uh, "I and You," uh, he doesn't say you very didn't say you very much in public, or I mean, <laughs> like in his real life, he was notoriously like kind of bad at a lot of um, at least day to day relations. He was very good with cats. Uh, he apparently had like nine cats in Jerusalem, but. Um, and they would just come in and out of his house all day and he would talk to them and know all of them and so on. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like everyone, and especially, you know, that whole crop of, of sort of spoiled Viennese and German intellectuals, they're all sure, ki right. kind of, I think, insufferable, like as human right, beings. Right, I mean, right. I don't know that I want to, right. I don't know that I want to talk to like Shola, Madorno, Benjamin or any of them for more than an hour. Or <laughs> so, right. They all seem kind of like jerks, but, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm assuming anyone who wrote these theories was working through them because they had a hard time doing them. I mean, I'm assuming if I don't know, but I'm assuming if you, you were just naturally very good at relating to things, you wouldn't bother putting pen to paper about it. You would just do it. Um, well, I, I always, um, in the back of my mind, uh, ha had Buber at you know the the nascent Jewish state, et cetera, and. And whether rightly or wrongly, but this touches a bit on what I saw you writing about. He he was advocating for a kind of relationality, uh, both in their in their geographical situation and um, but you you and I didn't get through all of it, but you were also talking about his interest in uh, art and anthropological anthropological philosophy. That this this for him had to do with like he thought it was he thought it was important for the right the soul of the of the. the yeah, younger Boober talks a lot more about soul of like, and he thinks that you, I mean, the younger Boober was a sort of less reflective Zionist than older Boober. Um, but yeah, I mean, a what, lot what happened? Of, what what changed? What I mean, I think just the reality, the, the actual sure. complexity of the situation, like forced him to rethink things. Also, you know, he was part of a group that's like, I'm really the wrong person to talk about this. I haven't studied sure. this extensively at all, but I mean, the groups that he were part of sort of just lost influence as well, right? A, the certain kind of leftish um, organizations. Uh, but for him, I mean, his interest was very aesthetic from the beginning, right? Like, I mean, art, his speeches at the Zionist Congresses are very clearly concerned with art and the state. Um, he, published several Jewish artists. And for him, 
I mean, there was a cliche in Germany at the time that Jews just basically couldn't be good artists. And he just takes these cliches and inverts them and tries to argue that the things that, that say people right. like Wagner called Cra flaws are actually good, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not Crash sure how... people, right? He distinguished between artists and kind of... Yeah, he was... So he was... So, and this is a bit more mature of him. So he, he becomes sort of more obsessed, independent of the sort of Zionist project or sort of as an anthropological project is like, where does the design, so for him thinking is a lot of thinking is in images, a lot of relating is in images and much of what we do in the world concerns images, the imagination, but real images, right? Not just sort of floaty fantasies. Um, he thinks these, and so his question is where does this desire come from and unsurprisingly given who he is the answer is something like the image making urge is is an urge to a kind of relationship that's both super personal so it involves kind of the social all at once but also individual that you're the one kind of fulfilling it so there are certain images I mean, I think most of us think like the way we carve up the world is sort of we have a we have a picture of the way the world works, and the picture precedes the thinking, right? So the thinking I have and the analytic claims and the arguments I make and sure. all the stuff that spews out of my mouth is usually just after the fact justifications for the picture. Sure, sure. Right. So the question is, is where does this picture come from? Does it come from you? Does it come from outside of you? And for Buber. <sighs> Look, I mean, uh, undergrads will often say to you something like the truth is within you and 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 uh, like sober minded adults will say, no, what's true is the world. The world is like hard and has, you know, edges and you have to whatever. And for Buber, they're both completely wrong. Probably the undergrad is in a better shape to like expand their picture than the sober minded adult <laughs> is usually lost to us. But um, for the, it's neither. It has to be neither or or both and neither at the same time if you want to be more dialectical so which which i don't like to be but yeah so i would just say it's neither it's and um sure and so the image making drive is in some respects fundamental um and where you your image of the universe does a lot for like how you feel and behave as, as a human um and the problem to go back to your question of like, where, where does this sort of block come from? Is that our you picture of the universe is now in, extremely clear. Um, it's, it's very lucid, it's very solid, but the weird thing is, is that we're not included in it. Um, I'm snickering over here a little bit because it, it as you talk, it, it refines for me that, that kind of what I do is I just help people be better at being disappointed. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's <laughs> just like, like, you know, come, I'll help you be better at being disappointed at the things that you thought you knew and and saw and had and don't anymore and how we can all somehow just bear that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think realizing that you can be disappointed and survive the disappointment is is, is very important. Sure. Um, Buber would not want to stop with disappointment, but he would want to break first the notion that the world is 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 as solid as you think it is. Sure. Um, because that solidity for him just block, it's too opaque, it blocks your ability to relate to things. Um, or like for him, there's a, in, in so far as he, he appropriates Hasidic thinking, uh, there's a spark in everything that you can relate to for Buber. Um, and I mean, everything, including this, you know, pre-manufactured crap lamp I see in front of me. Um, and that's where it gets really hard to buy this. I think it's very difficult to see how a manufactured good can, can have this. And this is where he maybe verges a bit too into the romantic, but because um, he doesn't really tackle that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm probably mixing uh, my own re research and interests, but something that that you know when, when it comes to to therapy or analysis there is there is always this idea i think freud used to there was always this question you know can, can anybody be analyzed right was always you know and i think there were comments well you know rich people can't be analyzed because not enough anxiety or you know and and but but there's also something i think that we've kind of updated our thinking around which is the way that that disappointment can get so corrupted developmentally mm -hmm. in in a chaotic environment and it seems to me when you sort of mention that that you know boober wouldn't want to stop at disappointment it's almost like when I, when someone can be disappointed that's when therapy begins <laughs> yeah, <laughs> until, yeah no, so until for that... him it's 
it's the the he would call it maybe even something like fear of god has to precede love of god but you don't want to have just one or the other for him right um so you have to have the kind of terror at how both vast and fragile things are um and that sort of combination of immensity and fragility is is sort of really hard to take. But if you stop there, so like a, someone like Kafka is going to stop there and be like, "What do you get out of this sort of vision of of of, of the infinite?" But um, we wrote in a letter once to Max Brod, one of Kafka's friends. Um, He's like, I love Kafka, but I would like to think you don't have to always be depressed. And uh, <laughs> and that's the thing. So for for Buber, you have. And this is why he's not a kind of hard ethical thinker in the way, say, Levinas or these other guys are, um, and they are mostly guys. Um, for him, you have an obligation to enjoy things and to um, relate to things and to look after yourself, um, precisely because everything is relational. Like if you poison yourself but try to build up someone else, it won't work. Um, as, as we know, if you torture yourself, you'll end up torturing the people around you. And uh, for him, there's also a religious obligation here. But first you have to have, an adult first has to have the fear. A kid doesn't, right, for him. They're not in the same world. But an adult usually has to have the fear to break down the uh, it world or the world of things in the crude sense of thing that they've built up. And uh, for him, and I think this is right, a lot of the time, the way that world breaks down is not by dialogue with another human, because that sort of keeps reaffirming the world, but also like a dialogue with something that's non-human, a non-human animal or a non-human object, or for some people, it's craft work. I mean, we know a lot of people, when they retire, they take up a craft and suddenly it opens up the world to them in a completely sure. different way. And part sure. of the reason is, okay, people talk a lot about creativity or expression or this other sort of somewhat fascist bullshit, but... Uh, it's they learn to relate to things. I mean, they learn to relate to paint. They learn to relate to physical objects. They um, and well, and it's a kind is, of denouement, I guess, as you're saying. I mean, I mean, uh, the, you know, you you mentioned the sort of loss of that kind of uh, that that kind of childish, you you know, uh, ability. And there's almost this return in some ways to relate <laughs> to to find some way to relate to objects. I think also you, you you are given the 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 opportunity once you say no longer working and exchanging your labor for some sort of abstract thing like money you 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 can become materialist again when you're older mm. like I mean most people are just insufficiently materialist so they don't actually relate to material objects at all they relate to signs symbols brands things like that and um and relation to material objects or things so look a lot of people didn't like boobers idea of relating of having dialogue with non-humans because they thought a it was silly and embarrassing and um embarrassing and B, that, that he would that he would embarrassing that he would that their teacher would would take say it up you, okay you need to talk right. to cats um so it's embarrassing um and and maybe impossible but that me but also for them the world is especially a lot of sort of politically minded people the, their world is actually very narrow and that it only involves humans and so it seems expansive because i mean how many humans are there now like eight billion or something too many but um it seems expansive you know you have art you've got your your music you've got all this stuff but if you can't relate but in a weird way, it's actually quite a narrow world to only relate to human beings and to only have dialogue with human beings. Sure. And it's a really self, it, it's a process that kind of affirms itself and becomes overly solid uh, and uses relationality to build bricks that then block relationality in the future. Um, well, I think I mentioned to you that, that I was speaking to a woman uh, today who I uh, mentioned, I might bring this up in the podcast, who was almost a bit perplexed by the power of of this kind of solitude and relationship to animals you know it it there was a power there that she just couldn't quite wrap her head around and mm -hmm. uh uh yeah and i mean not everyone relates to everything all the time that would be completely bonkers but uh yeah some people it's animals some people it, it's sure you know i don't know whatever whatever's around um um, and I mean, sure. I don't know, it's, 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 it's a confusing picture of the world, but, and I'm not sure he, it, there's, there's big gaps and problems, but I don't want to say like Boober is going to solve all your problems. If you want to understand relation, he won't, but, uh, 
his sort of insight that relationality gives you something or access to something that nothing else does and that this is important and that it's not actually human, like exclusively human, is, is these are all sort of essential insights. Well, it's um, one of the single biggest laments, I think, that comes into my office uh, is, is the impermanence of relationships, but also the initial, you know, the, 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 the fall that just keeps seemingly just keeps happening over and over again until, you know, we have our last one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I feel just as a final kind of piece here, because you mentioned your kids, uh, you know, I know that for me professionally, it's been an infinite source of, uh, I don't know, testing what I thought I knew. Uh, but I wonder how that's been for you to have two young children with regard to, to what you study. Um, it's been... Okay, so the problem is I write very slowly. So I'm still working through my dead cat. Uh, I haven't <laughs> got to the kids yet. Uh, when I They'll be part of this supposed book that I'm working on, but uh, a central part, literally the central part. But um, I mean, they have changed things. A lot of the time they've put flesh on the bones of a sort of theory I had before or, or forced me to change it. Um, and it's of course transformed my life, but I've always been very attentive to kids. So it's not like some people, I think it's a bit more shocking when they have kids sure, because they're sure. not around children. But I mean, I was the eldest of four and I've always liked kids and I've taught children my like a lot of my life. Um, but yeah, how does it changed it? Um, watching them say hello to animals or like, or actually just, so, okay, a lot of, let me put it very simply. Um, say you accept that you can have dialogues with cats and stones and remote controls and whatever your car a lot of people i i know not me i i hate cars with a fiery passion but for a lot of like i know people for whom like their car or their motorcycle is like a thing sure, they have like, right, a serious sure. relationship with sure um and it's a it's a weird relationship but it's a real relationship um so say you accept you can have these relationships and these dialogues so the sort of banal question that comes up that you have to deal with is, is well, how, like, how do you do that? Right. Um, and so one thing that having kids sort of helped me. So like one way you can relate to objects is by craft, right? How do you talk to a kid who doesn't talk like a, like an infant? Um, and I was banging my head against it. And then I was reading Melanie Klein and I realized, Oh, I'm it, it's, if you play with them, Right. It's it's very simple. And so but that my kids helped me realize the extent to which play is, is a form of dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, also watching them when they talk to animals, they would just mimic the sounds of the animals. So like in Ramona, she's she's like my, 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 my youngest, she's already got a fair bit of language, but she still will like if you, she hears a bird, sometimes she'll just like make the sound back to it um she says hello to bugs things like that so wa and watching them sort of talk without words and talk with play um and talk to each other in their own private language made me sort of see how it's, it's the, how you can answer the like well how question the sort of basic question which is as important as this is the sort of deep seeming question like the deep seeming question is like can you have a relationship the answer is yes but like the okay so how the hell do you do that is very important um like, yeah, that's so interesting that you came back to play. I mean, that was uh, the British psychoanalyst Winnicott. I mean, that yeah. was his big thing around transitional spaces, and and it's also what seems to go what, what seems to become impossible when we are kind of fr fr frozen. You know, uh, well, we're also like, just over we're overworked, right? I mean, almost uh, everyone I know has very little time. But to... I bristle at it sometimes when I read. You know, it's like, oh, just play or let your mind wander. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's I... kind of irritating. In the same way, a lot of therapy stuff is so like you read Melanie Klein, she's like, okay, so I saw this kid like five thousand four hundred thirty six times, and like no one can afford to do that anymore, right? right. I mean, no one has the money, sure. and even if they did, they don't have the time. Um, Right. So yeah, it's 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 tricky to know what to do when you're dealing with these people living in a world where they clearly just had way more spare time than we have. Uh, but yeah, play play is important. Also, as much as Winnicott theorizes it in a really wonderful way, um, 
Melanie Klein just did it. It was just, so when you read her works, you don't see it, but her method or like when people would describe her method, it's, she would just sit and play with kids for hours. Yes. On end. Too bad her children hated her so much. Oh, uh, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, a lot of people deal with things that they're incapable of doing in their day-to-day life. So, um, uh, but yeah, this, she would just play, um, Winnicott of course plays and then theorizes it. Um, but yeah, so I knew these theories, but it hadn't ever actually felt real to me or I'd never really understood it until I, I actually sat down and played with kids and my cat yeah. of 22 years is the first animal I had that really taught me the sort of way that um, non-human dialogue could like work and affect you and also <laughs> and also the weird blend between um, the transitory ephemeral nature of like the dialogical situation and then the commitment to own a cat for 22 years right I mean, right, every right, relationship, you mean, right. yeah, every relationship, yeah. I mean, if you, if you're married and you're serious about it, um, it means you, um, are committed to long, a long term, almost eternal on and off, like ebb and flow, right? Because right. every right. relational situation will end, but you're saying, even when it ends, I'm still here and even if you and I completely transform, we're still committed. Um, so it's not like the transitory nature of the kind of dialogue relation, like exhaust relation. Right? You, you still have to commit to it over and above that. And that's also where the sort of it world comes in. You know, a marriage, sure, maybe spiritual and internal and blah, blah, blah. But it's also, you know, there's an object, there's a ring, there's a group of people that come over and will make you feel bad if you if you get a divorce, these sorts of like, you know, right. um, they contain, they put up these walls around. The, yeah. And, yeah, and sure. And that's important. The same way yes. your work a day world builds like a bubble around a child's world. And so that the kid can run around like, you know, relating to rocks all day long and it doesn't matter. It's um, like when someone says to me when I'm assessing things and they say, you know, really, uh, I'm just here for the kids. And I'm like, oh, well, good. That, that's good. I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, to, I'm here for know. the kids too. Um, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, nice. like you know, when 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 your kid asks you when they're very little, like, what is what what do you do at work? I mean, like you know, part of it's just like I, I go to work so that like you can ask stupid questions like this. Um, <laughs> but um, and I don't fall apart, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I fall apart routinely, but maybe you you don't. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so you and, that's, you and that's, I both know that's not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so we'll skip over that. But um, yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the the tension. I mean, and the, the thing that makes Boobers just insistent on is you can't resolve the tension. Like there's no dialectic here. Like you, you, and this is where, again, he's very close to Freud without knowing it, that like you're going to, the same bad things are going to happen again and again. There's no way of getting around it. There's no solution there there just is what it is and even like you know the whole you know find eternity in the moment sort of stuff it, it you know it, it is just a moment it will it will go away um and that whole like cliche of like people attempt to i think sort of in a cheap way capture the moment of dialogue with things like you know live in the moment or whatever this sort of toxic um well, live every moment as if it were your last i mean which i guess would just be crying and calling your parents and apologizing or whatever um something absolutely well you, you, Jung was infuriating in this way too and this was what my writing was on but that that in one moment he talks about these moments of of the transcendent function as being you know he called it god he called it uh whatever some black power that we connect to and then you know, other moments, he's like, no, it's just two thoughts coming together and producing a new thought. And that's really all it is. It's just some synthesis of, of thinking. And yeah, I can appreciate why yeah. that existed in, yes, in such, in such polarizing ways, because it's, it's, I think it's confusing. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the question, the, the problem with Jung, I think, is that he tries to, he tries to synthesize this and come up with like a, a sort of whole world. And Boober is very clear. There is the world, and then there's this sort of fractured space of relation, which is sort of in and of the world in one way, but in a way is is not um, of the world in a sort of standard way. It's not. It recasts the world, and like I said, to go back to that painting, and maybe I have a relational moment. I, I paint some sort of Rothkoish painting, and then you know maybe someone kid comes to the art gallery and looks at it and has this sort of it, it inspires a new relation. So some things inspire more sure, relations sure, right, right, than others. Right, sure. But um, when that happens, there's 
there's a crack and you, you're no longer in the kind of solid world of, of things and space and time and everything being well ordered. Everything is, is actually in your space and time of the relationship, right? Um, well, thank you for creating this fractured space yeah. of relation with me. I know you have yeah, <laughs> some, I, some worldly I, duties to attend to. I have to. more things to fracture. Um, <laughs> so anyway, well, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. <laughs>